I'm Dylan Radigan. I've interviewed nearly every CEO and most world leaders during the past 25 years. And now I'm bootstrapping. I'm turning my attention to the new CEOs and the irrepressible entrepreneurs leading the next generation of innovation in the world. Welcome back to Tasty Live. I am Dylan Radigan. It's time for another episode of Bootstrapping. Our guest today, Jeff Desjardins, the founder of a company called The Visual Capitalist. I think you may remember we had uh, one of the reporters from Visual Capitalist on a recent episode of Bootstrapping. Uh, well, uh, uh, Jeff joins us now um, to talk about the business itself. Um, and it's a pleasure to meet you, uh, Jeff. Congratulations on what uh, certainly superficially, just from browsing the site, looks like a, a wonderful uh, property. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's, um, you know, taking some time to get here, but uh, now, now it's really an archive of, uh, of thousands of visualizations on, you know, every data set imaginable. So we're, we're having fun. Yeah. It, it's, it's apparent and the visualizations are great and useful and all the things. Um, what percentage of information, this is a, a, what percentage of information or what percentage of data do you think is not clearly understood or digested because of the way it's presented. Oh my God. Um, we're going to start with, we're going to start with this, right? Um, yeah. I mean, listen, that's because I, I, I think most, if, you know, it's, you know the, we all know the saying, whatever it is, lies, damn lies and statistics. Um, but yeah, I mean, how much of a problem is data presentation? So obviously it, it, it's a massive problem. That's why we do what we do. But, but I think one of the, the maybe underappreciated things is that, Data is actually the amount of data that we have in the world, what, what's generated, replicated, created each day. It's actually doubling every uh, two years. So um, so if you think of it this way, there, there's basically been more data created in the last couple of years than there has been in all of human history before that. So if you think of it in that context, even if we were good at telling stories, even if we were good at visualizing data and, and helping people understand things, it doesn't matter because data is increasing at such a fast rate that we can't keep up anyways. Um, so that, that's the, the sort of context that I think of it in, but certainly you're right. Uh, the vast majority of, uh, of people, you know, will take data and say, Hey, look at the spreadsheet. Hopefully you get the same thing of it out of that I got. Right. Or they put it in a chart, but the chart doesn't have a story. It doesn't, uh, it, 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 you know, or it's humans, off scale or it has significant omissions. I mean, it never ends. Sure. Um, yeah, well, hum humans have been storytelling for tens of thousands of years, right? So that's how we understand things. And so when you just give someone a chart and say, hopefully you understand this, you're not catering to how humans actually interpret information, right? So, mm -hmm. so yeah, to, to answer your question, I, I would say the, you know, 99% of stuff is not done in the most compelling way. And, and so what, I mean, you've been doing this since 2011. So you, what are some of your, like, what's your key advice? In other words, if you're trying to communicate data, you know, what are some of the key, like first principles of data presentation? Yeah, so so first thing I, I would do is I would zoom out and I would say, so, so there's three components to data storytelling. There's the data, there's the narrative, and then there's obviously the visuals. And so if you break down each three of those things, um, you know, obviously you have, uh, kind of key things that you need to think about in each area, right? So within the data, I like to think about, you know, um, have you, have, you know, have you massaged down this data really to the most key points that you actually want to illustrate? Um, and, and this is, it seems like an obvious thing, right? When we're talking about it, but a lot of people don't do that, right? A lot of people present way too much or they don't give the context of what they're talking about or, you know, and, and then the chart is meaningless or, or, or whatever, but, um, you know, this is something that's really important. You have to be able to take the data and reduce it down to the the most important and pertinent points. And of course, you have are there to... any universal rules relative to things, whether it's the use of extremes or the use of averages or the use of of um, you know the, the, re the relation data's relationship with either outliers or averages? I guess would be the two uh, things that can be both very insightful and also extremely misleading. Yes, they can. Um, for, for me, with the data itself, I think the most important thing is that you have something that you can parlay into a story, right? So, how, and how do you do that? Well, 
if if you're if you're trying if you're taking two data points that are vastly different, if there if there is a a big delta there, then that automatically leads itself to telling a story. Why is this small and why is this high, or something like that, right? So, but it, but so, so to me, it's how these three things interplay, right? Um, so if you if you pass off to the um, you know the narrative part, the storytelling part, it's um, it, it's the same thing. So as the data is only as good as its ability to support a story. Absolutely. Yeah. Because again, like if you have an insight and, uh, and you're not properly putting it in the context of a story or, or showing it to people in a way that's compelling, then I think the odds are that very few people are going to remember your insight. And, and if you're a decision maker, or if you're, you're trying to move things up the ladder, if you're trying to convey your story to investors or whatever you're trying to do, if you don't combine these things together, it's much less likely people are going to remember what you're talking about and therefore be influenced by you. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do with data storytelling is you're trying to influence someone about something, right? Mm -hmm. And so then what is the visual capitalist business model? Do you offer, like if I'm a third party, I'm a, a, a consumer products company and I want data on all the air filters in the world or all of the car tires in the world or the durability of, I don't know, some, I'm thinking of, of a commercial application like do you do that for third parties like that like do you provide what is what's your business model so primarily the idea of uh, of how we operate the business is um so we're trying to tell the stories that we think are compelling that people want to hear over, over time we've been able to build up a large audience we have about four hundred thousand people on our daily email list around eight million people that visit the website each month get a lot of traction through social and places like that. And, um, and, and so we're essentially a media company in that sense. And that we're it's an editorial strategy and not a commercial, right. not a corporate. Right, right. It's an editorial strategy. We're, we're trying to get, um, you know, we have people that are working full time here, like uh, Niccolo, who you had on earlier. They're trying to figure out what are the most interesting things that people want to know and, and that could help them understand the world. That's what they spend all day doing. Um, and and, uh, and so we're trying to you know visualize things that people find compelling, and, and then what we do is is we have th through the different um, aspects of our sort of uh, media and marketing mix, we're able to uh, align ourselves with brands that want to that also want to sort of uh, be a part of this, right? That that want to. Um, be a part of sort of these really cool visuals that are that are getting in front of people. They're not integrated into our editorial stuff, but they're put alongside it through advertisements or through their own branded content that they create with us. And, and you know, so often- but so like, could a car company do a visualization on the longevity of cars, you know, and, and then- like yeah, yeah, I think so. Like could Mercedes come to you and say, I want to do which car is the best at a hundred thousand miles or how would I, I mean, this is, I'm probably being too transactional or too crass relative to what you might do, but you understand where I'm headed. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, we obviously look at it a bit more holistically than that. Like let's put together a full strategy of how we can work you in, but yeah, that would be one individual brand of content piece that we might do with them and say, Hey, like if we cover this, topic and it's it's branded content for you it's it's going to put your brand in in, a, in the right light right mm -hmm. um but yeah that's that so that's a portion of of what we do that's probably 80 percent of of revenue is through this um you know through this side of things uh mm -hmm. but then we also have a a paid uh subscription product as well we also license our content out to people that want to use it and and white label it um those are two new so i could be like a business. news agency or corporation and i can yeah. pay you a fee to embed your visualizations in in my whatever I'm doing. Do yeah, know? and so we actually allow them to access the source files and then white label it. So, for example, in uh, you know different newspapers uh, in France or places like that, they'll take our stuff, translate it into French, and white label it as their own uh, stuff. Remove our our stuff, and and uh, and therefore it looks like theirs. Uh, so that's kind of a growing part of the business. And is there a particular? vertical or category of data that is that, that gets the most the eyeballs political economic yeah. you know yeah. biological i don't know i i i find so we we cover a wide uh a wide variety of stuff as you would see on the site I saw. um i i think that that what it, what is interesting sometimes changes right with the narrative of what's going on so when when covid was happening for example uh obviously our editorial strategy pivoted to what is happening with covid how does that impact businesses you know how, how do these shutdowns impact economies and so on 
And so at work that participation, work from home, this, all correct. the things. Yeah. We're, all those things were popping up at that time. So, you know, we tried to cover those things because they were pertinent at that time. And now if you cover some of those things, you're, you're not going to get the same response necessarily. And so, so it, it's always changing what's important at the time. Um, I, I mean, there definitely are some general concepts, I think, that, uh, that are sort of evergreen. I think one of the ones that we've honed in on is we really like ranking things, really big picture things. Um, because I, I think it appeals to a wide amount of people that want to understand the world and how it works, right? So if you're looking at the 100 largest companies in the world, or if you're looking at countries by GDP or GDP per capita, or if you're, or if you're looking at some of these really macro statistics, but now ordered from best to worst, I, I think it really helps you look at that and understand what's happening uh, in, in a way that you can't really understand by reading uh, the Economist or, or or reading Forbes or or some other business publication. Like here's everything laid out in front of you in, in a way that's kind of un, unadulterated. I mean, we obviously, as we visualize things, we have to illustrate things. So there is some sort of bias applied in some way. But at the end of the day, it's it's just here's country number one, and here's a country two hundred, right? And so it is what it is, and you can look at it and you can take what you want from that. Mm -hmm. And and what have you learned about persuasion? Another because you t we talk about data. The purpose of data is to influence people to in to do something or think something or whatever it is. And have what insights do you have about not even so much data, but the mechanism of data presentation that is the most effective? So for me, I, I see it as we like we live in a very biased world, a world in which people are trying to impart their opinion on everything. And so for me, I, I think what I find to be persuasive is is stuff that actually caters to the opposite of that stuff that you look at it and you're like, this is pure data is it, something that is um, it, it's not trying to swing my opinion in a certain way. They're, they're not trying to cherry pick data. They're trying to show the in, in, entire uh, information in, in a way that, you know, someone can look at it and get their own story from it. And so this, I think it seems sort of counterintuitive because everybody wants to take information and spin it in a certain direction. But I think that people have had so much of that over the last 10, 15 years of sort of the internet era and the way that algorithms work and people get put in filter bubbles and things like that. I think, and that's what I think one of the reasons that we've been successful, we don't cater to um, Republicans or Democrats or you know any other sort of political side of the spectrum or anything like that. We're just trying to take the world as, as, as we know it through data and visualize it in a way that people can understand. And even though you, you might call that persuasive or you might not call that persuasive, but the way that I see it is that, you know, it, it's much more trustworthy. And as a result of that, people know that we don't have an ax to grind. And so therefore it is more persuasive in, in, in helping people understand what they're looking at. So data that, that is the least, that, ha, that is the least, that has the, mo the, le the least apparent effort to influence is the one that is the most influential. Well, yeah, I mean, look at like, the, you know, this way, right? Like cre a credible basis of neutrality is the most influential thing. I, I think so. I mean, if I were to tell you, you know, uh, some data right now from, you know, uh, extremely left wing think tank or an extremely right wing think tank, right away, you discredit it, right? Right away, you'd be like, no, that, that comes from this source. So why are you telling me that? And, and, and I think that it's, it's kind of the same way with, with almost all media nowadays to me, right? Um, whether it's, mm -hmm. You know, the sure. New York Times or whether it's yeah. Fox or whatever, like, I don't want to hear it. I, I, I want to look at the, the data in, in the background. And I'm a smart guy. I want to make the decision for myself on what I think. And I think most people want to do that. But do, do you think on that front, whether it's the excess amount of data going to your earlier comment about, you know, more data the past couple of years in human history or the obvious sort of um, manipulation of, or selective omission or whatever you want to call it of data for whatever the agenda is. Do you feel like that represents the end of information? In other words, you know, ha we have so much information that we no longer have any information. Yeah. And this is definitely a, a problem that we've really honed in on and we're thinking a lot about. I, I do think that that's the direction things are generally headed in. Which is why I think that you know stuff that resembles what we do 
I see it as a, a nice breath of fresh air, I think, for a lot of people. I, I think that ultimately, you're right, there's so much out there that it, 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 it's, so there's, you know, a, a quote out there that we're kind of, um, we're, we're drowning in information, but we're, we're looking for wisdom or, or something like that. I'm paraphrasing it, but it's, you know, there's so much information out there that it's actually hard to extract the bits that are, that are important. There's no insight. There's just, right, a right. There's, there's a lack of it. There's more, a ton of information, but a lack of insight on, on how to actually, what to pull from that. And so, yeah, I, I, I certainly worry about that. Is it the end of it all? No, I, I think, I, I think that we're actually moving towards a, world where people are going to become more data literate. Um, I think we saw that over COVID is that people started seeing these, you know, charts and things like that, that, you know, that they weren't normally seeing and they're starting to understand, oh, okay, this is how exponential growth works or flatten the curve or all this stuff. They started to get more literate with this kind of stuff. And I think that it's going to continue happening um, maybe slowly, but I think it's going to continue happening. People are going to start to question, you know, some of the things uh, they're going to understand when people are, cherry picking data or, or not showing sort of both sides of the story, that kind of stuff. And I think eventually data is going to become more verifiable and, and more transparent through things like the blockchain. Um, so that, I mean, that's kind of, you know, pie in the sky, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But I do think we're moving in that direction. I think that's the, the, where people want to go with it. And I think that if you're able to look at data and understand this is the source that it comes from, it's transparent and it's verifiable. You can go and look, you know, two seconds later and say, yep, that came from the World Bank or yeah, that came from a McKinsey report in 2021. I think that that's, you know, that's moving towards a, a better world. And, and, and that's kind of what we do with our stuff. We try to, when we publish something, we say, hey, this came from here. If you want to go look at it yourself, you can go click on this thing. You can open up the, you know, table or Excel or whatever. And you're going to see that the data points that we have charted here are the exact same as in this spreadsheet. And so um, that builds up trust over time. What, what, kind, what kind of growth have you seen in your business recently, especially? Yeah, tons. So, so, so we grow at about um, a thirty to thirty-five percent clip per year, and it's all. It, I mean, it's it's growing along with the growth of data and the need for people to be able to pare it down and understand what's what's insightful. And so, I, I don't think that's a. I certainly, when we started the business, that we didn't understand that to be true. You know, we we thought, hey, these are cool. People will like them. Companies seem to like them. Um, people seem to. Uh, click on them and we were able to start building our audience. But over time, we realized that, no, this is actually a part of a larger trend, which is that people need this because of the way that data is going and because of the way that um, media is going. And so it, it's actually a much more sort of stable trend than we originally thought. Do you view your homepage as a news site? As an, as, as an, a, a, are you a competitor to... I don't know, pick your favorite news agency? I think yes and no. So I, so I think yes in that I, I think a lot of news agencies have data visualization arms. And so, for example, if you look at something like The Economist, I think they do a really good job. It's just, you know, one-tenth or one-twentieth of the stuff that they do, right? And um, so, so for us, it's, you know, A, we're, we try to be, um, you know, much more, uh, I, I guess, um, focus on doing something that's accessible to more people. Uh, the Economist is obviously a little bit on the highbrow side. Um, but you have just an editorial as, judgment on what you put in the middle of your front of your homepage or in the top left or the top right or whatever. Yeah. I'm just, that changes. Uh, I don't know whether, how often do you change that front page? Every day? Yeah, yeah. Every day we publish about two things. So, uh, so yeah, it, it's changing on the on the left side is basically a chronological order, so that just updates automatically. And then in the middle is kind of our top story, and that changes every three or four days based on when, when we have something that I think is really cool. We we put it there, obviously. Um, but uh, but yeah, no. It's it, in that sense we are you know we are a, a media company. We earn our ad. We earn money through ad dollars. We have an audience. Um, so we do compete with, with these other groups. It's just that at the same time, we're doing something that's quite different than a lot of them. Product, yeah. and, and so, so obviously there's a, a big differentiation there. So, I mean, you can, you can think of it in multiple, I mean, in, in like in modern times, media is really competing against everything, everything that generates eyeballs, right? It's not like you buy this paper or that paper and that's the end of the story. It's, you know, you can be distracted by someone who gets a notification on their phone or you can be distracted by, 
um, so, someone can be distracted by a video on TikTok and, and or they can look at the New York Times. I think, TikTok, I think TikTok qualifies as mind control at this point. <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> and, and, and then and then you have uh, four hours. You know, yeah, and yep. you have the educational stuff Living. going out in China, and then you have all of the uh, the you know the, the stuff that, that we get here. So uh, yeah, TikTok is, um, is very it's interesting. Vicious. It's it's shocking. I mean, I don't even mean it in the China sense. I'm just in the all of that. The, the, whatever they figured out is some wacky uh, voodoo, man. Um, <laughs> the uh, so what's hot right now? You mentioned COVID being really popular. Obviously, the COVID data. I'm assuming that's faded probably substantially. Um, I mean, has the COVID interest, first of all, collapsed completely? Is it gone? Because in many ways, it feels like COVID's gone in terms of the day-to-day dynamic. Yeah, I, I don't think that we explicitly go out of our way to do anything on that right now. Um, I, I think right now, the at least for the last year or so, I mean, these are things that that you guys would be covering through Tasty Live as well, but Things like inflation are are a big topic, right? Um, everybody, Recession, I would imagine, everybody wants to know what's happening there. I, I think there's a a geopolitical angle that that's really interesting right now. Um, people want to know what's going on with with countries like Russia and China, and they want to know how they, these countries compare uh, to Western economies in, in many different ways, and and politically and historically, and all these things. I, I think there's an element of you know, energy is, is really important right now. Uh, you know, the war in Ukraine really put that into perspective, I think. And so, yeah, these are some of the things that that we start, uh, we follow on an every, everyday basis. And then kind of about half of the stuff that we cover is related to like, what do we think is interesting right now? What, what is topical? The other half of stuff that we do is a little bit more evergreen. And so we're taking data that we know that comes out each year, uh, for example, a ranking of the world's top 100 brands or something like that. We know that's going to come out on a certain day and, and we're taking stuff like that and also visualizing that because we know that's the kind of big picture macro stuff that our audience really likes. So I'm assuming that you personally consume a lot, a lot of data. I, yeah, I do uh, across uh, across many different uh, disciplines. I, I'm Because of running Visual Capitalist for over 10 years. I'm one of those people that can talk a little bit about everything, but not in depth about anything. <laughs> but I, at the same time, I'm, I'm imagining you must have at least some interesting thesis of your own about the world based on the data. I mean, what's your opinion of inflation, for instance, or what's your opinion of the war, or what's your opinion of you know geopolitical dynamics? You know, Are you an optimist? Are you a pessimist? What's your high level point of view on the world politically, economically, and socially based on your interpretation of all this data you're swimming around in? Yeah, so I have obviously my own personal opinions on these things. I generally try to stay out of it because as as a media brand, we really try to stay impartial on all these things. Of course, I, I do have an opinion on them. Um, but what I, I would say that- It's an interpretation. Are you an optimist? It's an interpretation. And, and and also, you know, I I don't claim to to know more than other people or anything like that. And I, I I don't think that that's you know I think there are people that dive into these topics in much more depth than I do. Um, you know, maybe sometimes through what we consume and what we work with here, we do get to get sort of a macro picture of how some of these things work together. I I think that that might be unique. Um, but yeah, I would say generally speaking, I lean towards the optimist side about all of these things. Um, so give me some sort of data points that you observe that give, give support your optimism. Yeah, so, um, so okay, so if you look at something like, let's go interest rates. So interest rates have been declining for over 700 years, generally speaking. So if you go back to all of the you know different contracts and things like that that came out um, in like the 1400s, uh, and if you work your way all the way all the way till you know the early 20th century, whatever interest rates have always been you know much higher than they are even now, even though we think they're high right now, right? They've been hot, higher throughout history uh, and and trending down, trending towards zero. Um, so. Do they hit zero and, and they go negative? Well, they did for a little bit there, but is that kind of where we expect things to land in, in the long term? And, and I mean, is that an optimistic view? I don't know. It's it's kind of a um, 
it, it's an optimistic view, view in the, the context the cost of capital it, 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 for the cost of capital and in the context of obviously having 10 percent inflation isn't great either mm-hmm. um so you know i i i when you look at trends like this it, it's easy to say um for me at least it's like okay well maybe there's going to be small spurts of time where we have um you know higher interest rates or higher inflation or whatever but generally speaking there's some seems to be some dynamic out there that is kind of you know bringing them down to zero and, and bringing that cost of capital to zero and is that going to be something that happens in the next few years or is it going to take longer to play out or or is there going to be a little a bump or two in, in, in the middle here maybe but i think you know if if you were to guess where interest rates are going to be 20 years from now i think guessing around zero is probably not a bad guess what about the demographics? Uh, Japan people. Japan is too old. They're they're doomed. Europe's too old. They're doomed. Um, you know, Africa is the youngest continent in the world. It's going to be you know grow. It's going to be a growth ex- extravaganza. Or um, you know, Mexico is, has very good demographics. I mean, do you have an opinion on the demographic side or an interpretation of the demographics any more than anybody else? Yeah, we cover a lot about demographics. Um, I, I think you're. Your summary there basically sums up the uh, the world age and world demographics pretty well. Um, you know, Bill Gates highlighted something in, a, in his sort of note to their, the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, note that they put out each year. I think this was probably last year, the year before, but the median age in Africa is 18 years old, which I think is an incredible statistic. Um, incredible. If you think of that, that, half of the people are older than that half of the people are below that age, which is, which is just and wild. I think the 30 youngest at the mean average of the 30 youngest countries, I think they're all in Africa. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, I think, I think stuff like that is, is really interesting. I, I think that I, I see it as kind of a, um, you know, rather than think of it as optimism or pessimism, I, I think of it as a pendulum sw- swing, right. Where we're going from, you know, these wealthy established countries where obviously our, our median age has gone higher and we, we're eventually trend, we're trending towards having fewer and fewer children and, and so on. And, and that's all fine. We're, we're, everybody here is, you know, mostly living, you know, pretty good lives, right? But there are other places in the world, whether it's Africa or India, where the demographics are, are much more favorable and they're going to be on sort of long-term upswings and, and hopefully generating a lot of economic growth that we can all benefit from. Um, you know, when, when you look at China, they went through this, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and we all benefited from that. You know, maybe we benefited a little bit too much now, now that they're, a, it's a superpower and it kind of creates a whole other dynamic. But you're going to see a little bit of that with, with these other places too, right? As Africa and India, as these more favorable demographics, Mexico, as these places build up their economies and as we invest in them, um, I, I think that it's going to still benefit us on the side. That's that's kind of how the you know the global capital side of things works. All right, and your and the, my last question for you, which is simple but maybe impossible, but uh, what is the most important statistic that you like to monitor? I mean, I would say that median age is definitely one that we we watch Global very closely. Median age. Yeah. I, so in, in our, we have a book called Signals in the very first chapter. I think it's the best example of a trend that affects everything, right? Which is over time, the global median age has been rising since, or, you know, since around 1970 is projected to keep rising until 2100. So that's the global median age. And that, that, that has a lot of implications for a lot of economies around the world, whether good or bad. Uh, but then, of course, when you look at individual countries, as you just mentioned, you know, it really helps dictate the the fortunes for those places as well. But so I, I would say that that is a very important thing that we monitor. And if, you know, a top three thing uh, of things that I can think of right now. All right. Jeff Day Jardine, the company's a visual capitalist. If you haven't been to the website, take a visit. I was uh, just there myself. I, I visited it for the first time, Jeff, when we had your reporter on, but I spent more time on it today. Wonderful property, wonderful project. Congratulations on your success. Uh, I am Dylan Radigan. You are watching Tasty Live. This is Bootstrapping. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> 